Okay, next part here. We're going to see that uh, women have a very prominent role in this early phase of the revolution. Um, they are the ones who actually capture the king and bring him from Versailles to Paris. So how does that happen? All right, first off, um, <clears throat> there already obviously were rumors spreading that the king was planning to use military force to restore his authority, and these rumors were very much validated by the fact that there are so many troops in Versailles. Um, getting ready to put down the uh, National Assembly. We also see that these troops are going to move to Paris after the storming of the Bastille. So, um, so this makes a lot of people very nervous. Um, we're also going to see that uh, these shortages of bread are going to continue um, way after the summer. Um, they're going to keep they're they're still going to be present in October of 1789, which is actually when the Women's March to Versailles starts. All right, and, um, but the women need to have someone to kind of get them riled up enough to actually um, go through with this march. And so there's actually a man uh, kind of behind the Women's March to Versailles. His name was Jean-Paul Marat, and um, we're going to talk about him a little bit later as well. Um, but um, basically, Marat was um, a very radical revolutionary pamphleteer. Okay, so basically he published a bunch of literature that was uh, that was explaining why the king was so corrupt and why the nobility had so many problems. Um, it was really um, kind of inciting people to support the revolutionary government. All right, and it also made many women in Paris angry. All right, so many of them kind of read Jean Pomerat's literature and 7,000 of them got together. This is a huge number, right? 7,000 women as well as the Paris National Guard. So they also have their own kind of military support here. They march from Paris to Versailles. It's about 12 miles, okay? And when they get to Versailles, they demand that the king um, addresses their economic grievances, right? Like, what are you going to do about the fact that we can't pay for bread? What are you going to do about the fact that so many of us are unemployed? All right, um, we're going to see that uh, there's, again, unemployment because of reduced demands. I talked about that in the last slide. All right, um, this is actually going to affect women in particular because many women were involved in the putting out system and less people are buying their garments. All right, so basically, you know, if you work in the putting out system, if you're making, um, if you're making material um, kind of in your, in your cottage away from the city, um, merchants are no longer going to be selling you raw material. You're just going to basically have no work to do whatsoever. So what do these women do when they get to Versailles? Well, they try to find the king and queen, all right? Um, they actually are just as angry at the queen as they are the king. Um, Marie Antoinette was known for uh, kind of lavish spending. She was referred to as Madame Deficit by people who didn't like her. They also didn't like her because she wasn't French. She was Austrian. Um, so they're going after Marie Antoinette as well. They invade the royal apartments. They actually kill a bunch of the bodyguards of Marie Antoinette. They're kind of looking for her. Um, when they, when they come across the king, um, they actually force him as well as Marie, Marie Antoinette to move to Paris, right? So leave Versailles and go to Paris, all right? They are forced to live in the, this uh, palace that's known as the Tuileries. Okay, so they end up um, they end up having to leave Versailles, um, and uh, this is actually going to to a certain extent appease some of the people that uh, that march to Versailles, uh, because Louis the Sixteenth actually meets with a bunch of women in the Tuileries, and he ends up signing decrees that guarantee um, b bread in Paris at more reasonable prices. All right, so you know there's there's something good that comes out of this. Also remember that. Um, having the king in Paris means that the king is going to be kind of closer to a lot of the people who have major issues with him. The Paris mob that stormed the Bastille, now if they have an issue with the king, he's right there. They don't have to worry about going all the way to Versailles to kind of get his attention. All right? The king is kind of removed from a lot of the revolutionary action when he's in Versailles, but not so much when he's in Paris. Okay, another thing that happens is that the National Assembly itself moves from Versailles to Paris. Okay, um, so um, the king's power is going to be reduced even more at this point. The only thing that a king can do now is uh, issue a temporary veto, all right? So, um, so he can kind of temporarily block the lawmaking process, um, <clears throat> and the assembly has much more authority. 
But one of the things that the king and the assembly make sure to do is to make bread available to the masses because they know that if they don't do anything, there's going to be continued violence, all right? And because of the violence that has already occurred, you have some people in the National Assembly who were more conservative who basically say, well, no, this isn't what we signed up for. This is getting way too out of control. So we have some conservative people in the National Assembly actually drop out. And some of them don't only leave the assembly, some of them actually leave France. Okay, and these people are going to be known as emigres. And we're going to talk about them uh, a little bit more today and also a little bit more in the future when we see France actually go to war with some other countries. Okay, the emigres are going to play an important role in that. Um, they're going to kind of, you know, uh, encourage leaders of other countries that the, the French Revolution needs to be put down. Okay, so this shows us that not everyone is behind the revolution if people are actually literally fleeing the country. All right, so because you have more conservative people dropping out, because the National Assembly is now kind of closer to the action in Paris, once it's in Paris, the National Assembly is going to kind of fall under the influence by the more radical people in the city. Um, so one of the first things that the National Assembly is going to take issue with, oh, just before we get to that, just a couple of images. This is the this is just an artist rendering of the march to Versailles, and this is Jean Paul Marat, the pamphleteer that kind of incited the women's march. So what we're going to see uh, the National Assembly do once it works to create a constitution, one of the first uh, old institutions that uh, that the National Assembly wants to control is the church. Um, so they write a document called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy. So what did this do? What did this do? Um, well, it has pretty dramatic effects. All right, what it ultimately does is it secular secularizes religion. Okay, so they make the church a national church. All right, so no longer is it subject to the authority of the Pope. It is now going to be controlled by the French government. Okay, they divide up the church into eighty three different dioceses. So there are eighty three different bishops. Um, controlling um, the different dioceses of the church in France. Okay, um, now all the clergymen are going to be elected by and paid by the state, all right, no longer by a larger church outside of France's authority. It's going to abolish convents and monasteries, um, and the church property that they confiscate is actually going to be used to pay off the national debt. All right, it also is going to undermine um, religious orders and schools. Um, so what we're going to see if clergymen now, they're forbidden to accept the authority of the Pope. They're supposed to, uh, basically be subordinate to the government instead. Um, what the revolutionary government does is it forces the clergy to take what's called a loyalty oath, basically saying, okay, we're subject to this new government. We're no longer subject to the Pope. All right. This is going to split the church in half. Okay, so some clergy members agree to the loyalty oath. Some are very much against it. They still believe that the Pope is uh, their authoritative figure. All right, we're going to see that um, in a lot of ways, the, um, the civil constitution of the clergy and the secularization of the church is going to be seen as one of the biggest mistakes that the revolutionary government uh, makes. All right. Um, you're going to see that uh, so Enlightenment thinkers are actually more supportive of the civil constitution of the clergy because remember a lot of Enlightenment thinkers are deists, even some of them go even farther to be um, completely secular. So they don't really have a problem with taking away the church's authority. But the Pope himself is going to condemn the civil constitution. Um, he says that it's just an act to subjugate the church. So you're going to see that basically half of the French priests decide to go along with the Pope and oppose the civil constitution and refuse to take the loyalty oath. And these people are going to be referred to as the refractory clergy. Okay, refractory meaning that they're opposing, that they're going against it. Um, the refractory clergy is also supported by the king who doesn't like the civil constitution. Um, a lot of former aristocrats and a lot of peasants as well as some urban working class members. All right, um, it's important to remember again uh, that the peasants kind of stop after the great fear, all right? Because once the National Assembly responds to a lot of their issues 
by uh, abolishing feudalism, they become less involved in the revolution's causes. So it kind of makes sense that the peasants are going to go along with the refractory clergy and refuse to accept the civil constitution of the clergy. Also, many peasants are very religious, very devoutly Catholic, so they don't like the government's attempt to take over the church. All right, the, and so this kind of goes along with this uh, third bullet point down here that it's confusing to the Catholic laity. They have always kind of been under the assumption that the Pope is the authoritative figure. So, um, so we're going to see that the Catholic laity, um, in many cases, the peasantry, are um, are really confused by what the revolutionary government is trying to do to the church. All right, and so you might ask the question then, why is the assembly seeking to control the church? It's leading to so many divides. Um, Basically, the church is seen as another form of public authority, all right, and uh, the National Assembly wants to be sovereign, and so not only does it want to put down the authority of the king, but it wants to put down the authority of the church, all right, it feels that the church should also be subordinate to the National Assembly. So the National Assembly is just attempting to control everything, not to be controlled by these previously very powerful institutions. Okay, so <clears throat> what happens next? Um, we're going to see the National Assembly is going to evolve into the Legislative Assembly. So I know there are a lot of different names, the States General to the National Assembly to the Legislative Assembly, okay? What's going to happen here? France is going to declare itself a constitutional monarchy, and the Legislative Assembly is going to be a unicameral legislature, which means there's one house. So you know how the United States has a bicameral legislature with the House of Representatives and the Senate? In France, the Legislative Assembly is going to be the only body, all right? They're not going to have two different houses. Okay, we're going to see that this is predominantly controlled by the middle class, all right? They are voting um, indirectly. They also have property qualifications to vote. Um, again, the king only has temporary veto power. Um, and when I say indirect elections, realize that still uh, not everybody can vote, all right? About half of the men over 25 can vote at this point. Okay, and this, the reason why it's just half is because the revolutionary government kind of uh, makes, a distinct, makes a distinction between what they call active and passive citizens. So they believe that men who pay a slightly higher tax are considered active. And so they can vote, but uh, people who pay lower taxes are still considered passive and don't have the ability to vote. So we see that not everyone has the ability. People who are paying higher taxes are the people who are actually voting. The Legislative Assembly also abolishes the nobility. And just like what they did with the church, they divide France into 83 departments. All right, And these are all governed by elected officials. Okay, so basically instead of having the old provincial boundaries, we have these new, uh, new districts, right? 83 of them. Um, they're also going to have a new uh, system of courts, um, so basically France is going to have a more uniform administrative structure. So remember, the church is divided into 83 dioceses, France is divided into 83 departments, and also 83 judicial, judicial districts. This means that all towns are going to have the same form of government. Um, and so this also represents some decentralization, right? Basically, all 83 of these departments are going to be governed by an elected, by elected officials, right? Um, so this actually represents a little bit of a weakness in this new division of France into all these different uh, departments. Um, when they are decentralized, this means that uh, each local community kind of enforces legislation at their own discretion. So we have a little bit of inequality. Maybe some, uh, some departments actually are um, regulated a little bit more strictly, some a little bit less. And so this is going to be really difficult when war comes along and the government needs to really quickly raise the military. All right, next, we'll talk about some economic reforms during the revolution, but it looks like we're a little low on time. I've got 15-minute limits on these videos, so uh, we'll pick up with economic reforms in the next video.